grants which government is giving like Gyan or uh, Rusa funding and other initiatives, it's all uh, there for select institution, not necessary for broader base across all different types of institutions. So many a time, there is somewhere uh, a skewed approach only to maybe fund existing good ones. And at the time when you're doing it, you're also increasing the capacity. So when you're looking at funding, you're also saying now you recruit some more, increase your uh, batch size. And so it's going to dilute the excellence part of it. So when ma'am mentioned about alumni funding, that's one element which we are lacking in India. One is engagement with alumni. The moment we give a very good quality education, the engagement automatically happens. So if your Harvard talks about an endowment fund, obviously the engagement factor has been that because they have been able to impart that quality education to them. So they are on their own coming back and willing to give that. And plus when you have the accountability and the transparency as how the money is being effectively utilized, then it's a win-win model. Then people will just come and you'll have so much of surplus funds, then you have nothing to actually say that, okay, this is something which is self-financing. So you have people, different ways of actually people uh, from the industry, finance sector, coming to manage the endowment funds, investing in stock markets and flowing back. So that's a very interesting scenario, which not necessarily in our education, Indian uh, context, we face that, because everything is going unaccounted. So can we re-look at actually making more transparent? So even if you're taking extra, more than X amount of fees, you plow it back to the system, have a framework which is transparent, you have the vision community or, or who are the decision makers in the admission process accountable and make it completely open to the public and meritocracy is what demands. So obviously if you recruit the best talent, your output also will go up and the faculty also will get a better, uh, so it's a win-win kind of a situation. So somewhere we need to really look at excellence as approach. If we up give the best quality, pay our faculty well, then the output is automatically somewhere uh, given across. The other part was, um, there are a lot of scholarships, there are sabbaticals, reverse sabbaticals, industry chairs that are being uh, sponsored. Now, if there is a research output coming in, automatically industry will see value and they would invest in it. So you don't see too much of, uh, we do see funding coming from industry in terms of sponsoring chairs, but not necessarily across the board. You have CSR funds available also. We have uh, that government, the existing companies needs to invest some amount of their profits, 2% into the uh, any sphere. Now, how higher education can actually play a role, how companies can use the CRSR funds to finance higher education is one element to actually look at uh, is a potential scope. And uh, so endowments, attracting best talent, CSR funds, transparency, these are a few things which uh, comes to my mind about this. Quite a bit has already been Quite a bit has already been said about what I wanted to say. Okay, so ma'am, if you could like focus maybe a little more on yeah, the private so, sector. I mean, uh, um, I just want to say one thing, and that is uh, philanthropy that they are talking about. As far as India is concerned, I don't, I don't think that works on a big scale in our country. Okay, so philanthropy is something that they should not depend upon. We can have only, you know, uh, an Infosys or a Wipro, and those kind of institutes will believe in philo Tata's believing in philosophy, you know, philanthropy. So. That's something that I don't agree with from the NEP. But uh, yes, a lot of funding alumni is willing to give. Okay, uh, but that comes in only when there is quality education institute. Today we are at our, uh, in our college, we are able to get funding because we have attained a status. Before that, it was very difficult. Now to attain that status, you need funding. And many industries come forward saying that they are willing to set up institutes which they want us to run because we are academicians. They have the funding, but they want courses which will create graduates who, can, who they can employ. Now, that kind of freedom is not there because you have got uh, so many rules and regulations. So uh, we, what we do is we run some certificate programs with industry, okay? And so they themselves come in here. They tell us what they want. So between the professor and the industry, there is a module which is prepared and then we uh, give it to the students and that's working very well. But ma'am, what you're saying is if without rules and regulations, you can do much more. But yeah, yeah, that's what I'm trying to express is that what we can't do with rules and regulations, we are bypassing them in such a way that we don't break the rules and regulations, but we give the student what they want. So uh, we, are, we are all the time ignoring industry, which needs the people whom we are, uh, you know, um, creating. But when they need, what they need, we need to understand and give it to them. So when they are willing to put in the funding, 
why can't we give what they want? So I think the rules and regulations need to go down. In higher education, you can have funding. Funding is available, but there are problems related to that funding. There are too many problems related to it. Too much Thank of you. bureaucracy associated yeah, with the bureaucracy. funding, so it doesn't yeah. actually help much. Yeah. 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 We, we'll need the government funding, but we should do it in such a way that at the end, after a few years, okay, you take the government funding, develop a system of your own that you, you start to get your own funding by any other means. Uh, but if government is not there, then as Sir said, there could be a lot of black money. And if, too, if government is there, then there will be too much of bureaucracy. So there has to be a balance somewhere, uh, uh, some give and take, so that you get to give your students what they need. At the same time, there is a lot of transparency. Complete transparency is the first thing that you do. <clears throat> there is one other uh, point that uh, we missed out. Um, it is about the affiliating uh, system. Apparently, there are only four countries in the whole world that have the affiliating system. These are India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. No other country in the whole world has this affiliating system of one university and some 800 colleges coming under that, they all have to look up to That's some true. university level. So the teacher teaches something, but he or she cannot set the paper because it is set by somebody else. Exactly. So, so this is this is a major issue. This is one of the things. Because of that, if you try to go beyond something, then the students say that this is not coming in the exam. So, so if you look at if you look at the US university. So the, the, the university that came up with the affiliating system, UK, left it long time ago. Yeah. But we are still following it. If you look at the US, the university size, it can go anywhere from 4,000 to about 60,000, 70,000. That is the largest university. Smallest one will be three, 4,000 to the single location campus, which will be more like a college here. It is autonomous, it issues degree, it teaches whatever it wants, and some of them are excellent. Caltech is a very small place, three, four thousand people. But what they don't have to listen to anybody. They have their own things. I studied in a similar university, Rice University, which also has about 4,000 people. That's it. So there are, if you go to big universities like UT Austin, or Ohio, Iowa, and places like that, 60,000, 70,000, large universities. But even those are much smaller than, let's say, our Mumbai University, it's, which is a ocean. We get buried. So I think one of the things that we should mention is this affiliating system has to be looked at carefully. Can we replace it with something smaller, which will give more responsibilities and freedom for teachers at local level. This will also make, because right now what happens is, if there is any change that needs to be done, it may take several years. Even if a faculty member wants to do it, even if a college wants to do it, if a principal wants to do it, nothing can be done, unless it is approved for all the thousand colleges, 500 colleges. Yeah. So I think it is important to give that freedom to our colleges, and that alone could unleash quite a bit of innovation that could improve the quality of our education. And because the teachers will be answerable. If students don't pass, and the teacher is setting the paper, and you know, and the students also will not ask, why did you ask outside my portion? Because they said there are only 12 computer algorithms. Why did you ask? Why didn't you ask me a bubble start? Why did you ask me some other question? Right now, people can ask. I mean, it is crazy. Our students don't learn anything on their own. I think uh, this is something that we need to add. It is, I think it will come in any of the things. You want to improve quality. You want to remove innovation. You want to remove, you want to talk about um, uh, even financing. Because once the classes, once the colleges start doing well, and the tuition is re realistic, they don't have to go overseas. They can do it here. Exactly. It'll be a lot cheaper because, unfortunately, people like top, uh, uh, you know, in fact, 
Mr. Naranamurthy mentioned, I couldn't send my son to Cornell, I mean IIT, so I sent him to Cornell. What about the millions of people who can't do that? What about the millions of people? When, so we need to improve our quality, and that can happen partially by increasing the freedom, by having your rules, but enforcing them strictly. See, you charge, you charge whatever, I come back to that because this is most important. Charge whatever you want, but you charge one rupee more, I'm going to put you in jail. I think we need to have that. It is like GST. What is after all GST? It says everything should be, all should be taxed. But you get tax exemptions, tax breaks. Eventually, the money that you have to pay to the government will be a lot less. So can we come up with a GST-like system to the, that is transparent system, to the academic institutions? And we need to understand that academic institutions have to charge money, they have to pay. Either it should come from students, in, from classes of students who can pay, or from the government. Government, of course, now they can transfer the money directly to students, to those who are needy, who are from, who are from uh, disadvantaged communities and so on, they can be paid directly to the bank account. The colleges can charge the right amount from everybody, right? So there are many things that we need to discuss. So it is not just the uh, rules, it's also the implementation that's extremely important. I couldn't think of a better note to end the discussion on. Um, one last request I have from everyone. Uh, we will send you an email today itself. If you could just jot down your specific recommendations on each section. We'll mention all of that in the email. And if you could do that maybe the next couple of days. I know everyone's very busy, but Lynn, because we have a September 30 deadline as well. So what we'll do is we'll compile suggestions from this, this discussion also the emails you send us, and plus we've had some other consultations as well. And then we'll send a compiled document to the MHRD, which will of course mention all your names as part of stakeholders who've participated in the discussion. Um, um, last but like obviously not the well, least. Question, there is yes. another way to do that. One is to say, uh, if you complete this, whatever you have, because uh, you know, everybody has lots of things to say. She has come up with four pages of things and so on. So it will not be practical for us to give information. It is better you say that either you have a question on something that we said, you contact us and say, you want to elaborate on this. That's something we can do. Or if you have already summarized and you say that this is what we um, So I believe that um, um, there are some programs that can stand on their own. And um, I believe engineering is definitely one of them. And uh, there need not be any subsidies for that. I believe that the students are already paying lots of money. Unfortunately, a lot of it is uh, probably unaccounted. I think if we know exactly this is what is paid and that money is able to support the faculty members, there is enough money in the system. And if we pay the teachers well, the students will become employable. And as a result, more seats will get filled up. Now, students are not getting jobs, so there are many vacant seats. All that they have to do is pay the faculty members well, which is possible from the money raised from the students. A lot of money goes as black money right now. It's not accounted. So once we do that, I believe that uh, I mean, the thing is about financing higher education. I, sh I would say that in, we have to identify areas where higher education need not be supported by the government so much. Because to do R&D, those must be targeted activities. There are some areas um, where we want to do greenfield research, uh, open-ended research in um, physics, in uh, uh, in uh, maybe humanities and so on, where uh, the government has to give support. I would actually worry about supporting school education. That is something not even mentioned. So, as I, you know, uh, if we want to become a developed country, I believe that we have to improve our schooling. We have to let our children study, complete the schooling without stress of what they are going to do next that they don't have to prepare for some entrance exam, like JEE and so on, 
for five years, six years. We should get rid of that by providing vanilla bachelor's degree almost available on demand. So can we provide that? Can we say that at the bachelor's level, you go to any program, you will get reasonably good, will not be top of the line, not required. But if you take the top 1% of these students who pursue, they will be as good as IIT students, they might even be better. It is possible. So I think we need to reduce the stress by uh, and let students make the decision about engineering, arts, design, and so on at the next level, not at the bachelor's level. Let them worry about it at the master's level. They'll be mature enough. Then it may even be possible for them to go to good places by uh, self-funding and, um, um, and of course, uh, it is possible to, if we can improve the quality, students will get jobs and as a result, they will be able to take a loan and pay it back. So I would say that there has to be a priorita prioritization of what areas to be supported by the government and what are the areas that should be self-supported. And we need to discuss that. We need to, uh, the government should spend its money only on some difficult areas, important areas, whereas the professional areas and so on, they should be self-supported. And we should also support uh, school education in a bigger way. Thank you. So actually, I have to leave at 5. So perhaps it's better that others speak you know, and I'll listen. Is it OK? OK. So whenever it is time, okay, OK, OK, OK. okay. So I think that you know the, rea the, realism, the realistic point is that there are centrally funded institutions and there are state funded institutions, right? And they have a, a very different uh, outlook and very different objectives. The IITs were set up with a very different objectives. So making the IIT students pay just because anyway they are going for in or whatever. So then you know the real thing is to stop them from doing what they are doing or enable them to do actually work for developing India's engineering uh, framework. So I think you know our way of funding, you know, uh, our way of uh, you know uh, finance, you know, making the finances or of, of IIT seems to be post facto. That anyway they are doing this, so now let us charge them fees. That's not the the purpose of IIT was different, or purpose of JNU was different. And there, you know, if there's a clear purpose that we want to generate elite knowledge or elite agents who are going to later on become something, and they need to be because we need the smartest and the best, and they need not be hampered by their own personal. So that's a different story. I think to, you know, to club all of this together seems to be a bad idea. And overall, I think that, you know, how is education to be valued or how is public health valued? So if you improve the health of your citizen, then the cost incurred, labor cost or whatever, welfare cost and so on, and they feed back into the economy and society and thereby generate support. So to, you know, to put the edu higher education institution on on a you know profit and loss account because these are long term you know investments so i think before we uh, tackle the financialization question i think what are the outcomes of institutions and how do they really generate value over their life cycle so i think what me, you know if you want to analyze financing see what was our passing out batch 20 years ago right and what value have they generated in society and therefore you know this is the value that was through taxes has already been given and so on. So I think if they have not generated value, you know, and then you have, you know, it's on the state exchequer, then you need to recover that value from somewhere. Right. So I think it should, it is more uh, a longer loop. So I don't think, you know, it should be more. So what I think is this question of financialization should be more driven by philosophy and long term accounting rather than just making you know foreign capital or whatever or, or faculty payment fees and so on so i think the objectives are different and we should handle it in a different way and have a longer accounting cycle that's my take on it so i don't really have much to much different to say <laughs> Uh, so I will uh, talk on, on the alumni funding, uh, which uh, because I am familiar with that because I was handling in IIT for a you know, couple of years. So uh, whether uh, it, it is a private university or a government funded university, uh, the alumni are good source of, you know, uh, they can uh, raise a lot of funds. And 
IIT has been doing this for a couple of years. Um, uh, mainly uh, uh, after, um, uh, usually uh, every December we have alumni day and uh, we have silver jubilee reunion. And so uh, most of the alumni they give uh, for a particular project. And when they, and so the two things which are very important, uh, alumni want to uh, give it for a targeted project. And they also want to see the outcome, uh, whether it is going to the right cause. So trans uh, transparency is very important and accountability is very important. And I'll just give a, a case study. Like uh, Nandan Nilakani, he was from Hostel 8 and he gave money to you know, modernize the kitchen. And in fact, uh, Kanan was that time the warden and uh, he did all, because uh, previously it was all um, old uh, chulas and all that, and it became all stainless steel kitchen. And then seeing that, uh, then Kanwal Reki came and then he uh, gave money for modernizing all the hostels. So when they see that things are happening in the right way, they are ready to you know, give money. And this is one way of you know, generating money from alumni. And uh, IIT has been very successful. We have uh, alumni funded the buildings, we have alumni funded uh, labs, uh, scholarships, there are more than 30 projects which are uh, like uh, funded by alumni and uh, it has been you know very successful. Um, on uh, I think the financial regulation and the you know the autonomy which we talk about today I think in terms of college it is a really difficult situation to achieve financial autonomy. Uh, and, and to quite an extent, we will be dependent on the government resources in terms of augmenting our uh, infrastructure and for various grants that we receive and all. And second thing is that I think the PPP model is in the long run going to be the most effective model because uh, with the globalization coming in, I don't see we can stop private, private uh, stakeholders to be in or prevent them from investing into educational institutes because I think they have the capital and we may have the expertise and they they may also have the expertise and so somewhere we need to collaborate and uh, you know the infrastructure that we have and the and the uh, whatever experience that they have they could be brought together and i think this could be a fruitful collaboration in terms of generating revenues because the moment you have more relevant courses which are industry specific and in the market specific then i think the value of your courses goes up and then if there is a certain amount of deregulation which is provided in terms of fixing the fee amount for various programs and all, I think then it could be a more sustainable basis for generating funds which could uh, lead to better, uh, what do you say, sort of investing back into the system and continuously improving it. And the second part is that I think somewhere uh, the augmentation of the existing infrastructure is very much required. Because already, uh, I think there are some institutions which are extremely in the outstanding category and some in the, in the really, uh, I think, excellent category. But there are the very good ones which can really be made into excellent. And I think somewhere this effort has to come, whether it's private funding or whether it's the government funding, whichever is possible, or international funding, some international collaborations. So these also could be one area which we could look at. But one more factor is that with the privatization coming in, we know that the programs are becoming expensive, uh, education has become branded, and there is a price at which education comes. And so here, I think certain amount of regulation will be required to ensure that the education does not go out of the hand of the common person. And then we ensure that inclusiveness is maintained. So there has to be quality, there has to be augmentation, there has to be also the broadening of the base, Accessibility has to be increased and I think uh, the whole thing should be, I think the last point I really appreciate is to encourage excellence and efficiency performance based funding of the higher education. And somewhere we need to benchmark which institutions receive the grant is a big question mark. Because those which may not be having the enough uh, you know, facility to sort of upgrade themselves, they are getting it. And those which require, sometimes they are not able to get it. And so we need to have a more transparent system. So somewhere when you're talking about higher education, you always say, or education per se, you say it's not for profit. And obviously we can't measure it in the financial terms. There's a lot of things which needs to be go, gone and looked at from the social good aspect. But in higher education, you do have a lot of scope for creating your own funds. Uh, sir did mention about uh, 
the black money and a lot of things which are actually coming into the education sphere, be it in school, college or higher education, they are not necessarily ploughed back for the institution. So the people who actually are the teachers or the people who are working for the academic, uh, you know, furthering the studies uh, are not necessarily paid. So we do realize that the faculty teaching, they are teaching students who are going to get a package much more than them when they pass out. So one is the faculty remuneration does necessarily need to be looked at. You do have seventh pay commission coming in, but how far institutions are ready to cope up or uh, able to shell out that money is a question altogether one aspect. But having said that, uh, when you look at... I think the Latin I think the Latin Yeah. Yes. Just in case there is, uh, like there are some topics we didn't talk about. So if there is some topic somebody wants to like, send specific suggestions on, please feel free to do so as well. Thank you so much. I mean, I know it's not been easy to spare time on such a day. So thank you so much. It's such short notice to come and help us out. Bringing all of us together here, and you know, taking an initiative like this, you know, it's, I think it's a, it's an exercise for all of us too, and it's a great learning experience for all of us. Please come to, please visit to one if otherwise also. I mean, there are a lot of projects going on. Be sure we can use your help on different projects at different times. Thank you so much. Great team you have, and I think we need to congratulate you.